Hey, what's up guys? It's Jonathan with Referee Moto. Standing here on the side of the road in Shadwell, just east of Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, literally at the historical marker marking the birthplace of Thomas Jefferson. So pretty cool. It's a beautiful day to be out on a motorcycle ride today. Can't wait to go riding with you. It's about 80 degrees and breezy, low humidity. Lots of bugs though. And I'm walking around in poison ivy, so let's get going. All right. It's a beautiful day. Thanks again so much for riding with me today. Be careful getting out of here. All right, here we go. So after my last video, I completely failed with audio recording. I had placed my lav mic uh, clipped on my pocket and it was just way too much wind noise with it just kind of being out in the open. So today, uh, I've done some research and I don't know if it's gonna work for me, but we'll, we'll see. I've placed the lav mic with the, with the dead cat on it. Uh, like the wind muff uh, placed inside my my pocket you know that little secret pocket in your jeans so we'll see if it makes a difference that's just recording the exhaust sound of the motorcycle which I think is important to hear uh, for you while you're watching uh, kind of adds to the experience I know if you're watching on a phone or a TV sometimes you can't really hear that too well anyway depending on what kind of speakers you have but um, I know that when I listen to motor vlogs and motorcycle riding videos with headphones, a proper audio is very important. So this uh, this August 2024 is I'm coming up on my ninth anniversary of uh, sobriety. Um, if you haven't watched any of my other videos, uh, I talk about um, the fact that I have been, um, that for many years in my life, oh gosh, it's hot, sorry. Um, for many years in my life, I, I was addicted to alcohol. And it's not something I'm proud of, but it's something that, that I'm not afraid to talk about because I know that a lot of people struggle with addiction and then oftentimes addiction is uh, something that is people trying to cope with things that they that are unresolved, unresolved trauma in their life, uh, bad things happening to them in childhood and and just in their lives in general that uh, they turn to unhealthy coping coping mechanisms because it's easier than the healthy ones a lot of times. Like the healthy ones would include facing your trauma with a counselor and a therapist and, and that means you got to relive it really by talking about it um, so you know that's just one of the reasons that, that I try to tell my story shared my story in a book and um, in the movie that was created out of the book it's like the longest light ever um, but you know I uh, I do that from a place of uh, you know I was able to overcome it, but it was very difficult. And so I just wanted, like, if you're struggling today, if you have a um, a struggle with alcohol or drugs, um, there, you're not alone. Like, there's so many people out there that struggle with that. And if you don't struggle personally, I'm sure you know somebody who does. You know, almost everyone has someone in their family uh, that has struggled or is struggling with drugs or alcohol or some other addictive thing. Um, and so, you know, it's a lot more normal than, than we think. And, and I think especially now, like with um, so many different 
pharmaceutical companies, you know, and, and doctors that are prescribing pain medication that's uh, highly addictive. Uh, it has reached, uh, addiction has reached a new epidemic as far as uh, being addi addicted or their addiction coming from um, prescription medication. Like they, they injured their back, got in a car crash, injured their back, um, or had a, a accident where they got hurt at work, you know, fell off a ladder, you name it. And they go to the hospital, they go to the ER for treatment, they get prescribed uh, pain medication, and often that leads to an addiction to the pain medication uh, because of the things in it, like, uh, you know, uh, that are derived from addictive drugs. Um, so oftentimes that leads to an opiate addiction and sometimes it's cheaper to go the illegal route and so it leads to heroin and fentanyl and um, things like that and then people overdose and die so it's really a problem i mean not only the p fact that people are dying from the overdoses you know young people especially uh, but it's also a real problem that uh you know just living with an addiction these people are willing to become criminals to feed their addiction because they need it so badly and uh you know i think that i've never been addicted to anything other than alcohol but i know that um it seems to me that that the drugs are maybe a little more powerful i'm not sure certainly more mind altering uh, just because people are de so desperate and willing to do things uh, like steal um, and other crimes to support their habit. So, you know, addiction is um, a huge em epidemic um, in this country and, and around the world. And so uh, I wanted to share with you today, like, how uh, I actually quit drinking. How did I quit drinking? And I'm hoping that it will help someone else that has an alcohol problem. Um, and so I would say that my quitting drinking was multifaceted. Um, number one, uh, I had an accountability partner. Uh, but before I even had an accountability partner, I had to make a choice. I had to make the decision that I was going to quit. And I'm not talking about just a, like I'm cutting back. I'm talking about, you know, this is a life choice. And um, I made the conscious decision that I was so tired of being dependent on alcohol uh, and so tired of being, uh, you know, spending $300, $350 a month at the time. It was nine years ago. So today it would probably be like $1 million. No, just kidding. Um, at least 500 bucks a month probably I mean everything's gone up so um, I feel like uh, th that it was a lot lot of money I mean that this motorcycle costs per month less than my drinking habit sometimes was costing so and that was nine years ago so today it's costing less um, but I had I made that decision that you know not only was I tired of spending all that money on it, but I was tired of feeling like crap all the time. I felt uh, so horrible all the time, just headache every day, uh, feeling like I was needing a drink, you know, needing that alcohol, needing that feeling uh, that the alcohol would give me. And if I didn't drink, uh, if I didn't get it by a certain time of day. Uh, not only would I become a very irritable, um, I was kind of irritable all the time, uh, but beyond that, I would feel like things were crawling on me, like bugs were crawling on my skin. And yes, I'm kind of squitting today. I, I do have my full face helmet on, um, but I do not have my jacket on, so um, I'm guilty as charged. But um, yeah, I would feel like things were uh, crawling on me, uh, withdrawal, physical withdrawal symptoms. I would feel like, you know, I'd have to scratch all the time. Like, um, 
it, it's just uh, you feel gross. Uh, you just feel horrible all the time. You feel like uh, you just you're in another world. It, it, it's it's just awful. And it was a vicious cycle. Uh, so I felt like I was completely trapped with no way out of this vicious cycle of addiction. And we're talking, we're not talking months, we're not talking a year, we're talking like eight, nine years of my life that, that uh, this problem got worse and worse. You know, and it started out, by the way, it started out very innocently enough um, with social drinking, uh, poker games, with friends, things like that. And I kind of liked the way that it made me feel. Uh, never had a drinking problem before, uh, but you know, with childhood trauma, uh, the loss of my father, uh, you know, he, he uh, fought cancer for 13 months when I was 11 years old, and I watched him die. Uh, we took care of him on our, in our home for the last couple months before he passed away in our home. So that childhood trauma compounded with, uh, that I never faced, I never resolved, I never saw a counselor for, um, battled lots of depression and anger and anxiety and all sorts of issues uh, throughout my life as I uh, became a young man and grew up uh, 20s you know uh, but I never had a drinking problem until I became a police officer and then I started seeing all sorts of horrible things on almost a daily basis I was a fatal crash reconstruction officer for seven years you know, saw a lot of death, a lot of um, uh, a lot of people killed in car crashes, and uh, a lot of anxiety about that. Where even today, I have to have the safest vehicles. It's funny because I'm riding a motorcycle, but for my family, you know, like I have to have safe vehicles. Um, I'm so paranoid that I used to be really, really paranoid anytime I got in the car that uh, I was going to be involved in a horrible crash. Um, so just. Uh, just from being exposed to so many horrible wrecks and so many people killed um, and getting up close and personal on pretty flowers uh, up close and personal with uh, the families you know being that liaison to fi uh, the families of victims people killed um, so you know that's what what kind of stemmed me getting into uh, and I didn't have to alcohol I didn't have any coping, healthy coping mechanisms. I mean, they were there, like motorcycles were in my life, um, and the exercise, going to the gym and stuff was in my life, but ultimately, uh, it, it wasn't enough, you know, because I really wasn't facing what was bringing me down, what was uh, making me feel this way, and what was screwing up my brain, screwing up my thoughts, and screwing up the way I perceive the world on a daily basis. So, all that to say, you know, alcoholism got worse and worse and worse. Uh, you know, kind of became a total jerk, a total prick. Uh, you know, my, my family suffered, my wife, uh, my young daughter at the time. You know, when I quit drinking, she was uh, five and a half, I think, something like that, five years old. So, you know, um, it, it was a horrible, uh, a horrible thing to be trapped in. So, you know, you can read more about, you know, like the, all the details of, of my story. Uh, if you want to read my book, you know, the, the website's uh, BreakEveryChainMovie.com. But uh, I'm not here to sell you a book. I, I wanted to try to help you stop drinking or help somebody else that might be struggling with addiction. So once I finally made that choice, you know, that it just wasn't worth it anymore. That um, I needed to to make that decision to change my life. Uh, the first thing that, that I did was uh, I prayed. And, you know, it, you may not believe in God. You may not uh, believe in a higher power. But for me, I, I do. And so that was my first step was to pray and ask God uh, to take it from me. And so that was uh, at, at night, one night late in uh, mid-August, sorry, uh, 2015. And um, he's, you know, I, I feel like it definitely helped because, uh, you know, I certainly um, I've been able to walk away from it and never look back. Uh, but it's not like it's just a miracle snap of the fingers and everything's better. You have to do the work. Um, and so... The, the practical side
side of it. You know, if you don't feel like prayer is going to work or you don't believe in God, um, then let's talk about the, the practical things that I did that really helped me. Um, and that was, number one was an accountability partner. And, and so I, I had an accountability partner in an unexpected place because I hid my alcoholism for many years. I hid it for the entire time. You know, I, my wife would, um, we've been, I've been married for 20 years by the grace of God. Um, but my wife would, uh, come out, you know, in the mornings, uh, to go to work and she would see one, maybe two beer bottles in the trash can. But what she wouldn't see is, you know, the, the hard liquor, the whiskey, the, the vodka. I learned to kind of um, mostly drink clear alcohols because it didn't smell as, as much um, on my breath and, and things like that. But she wouldn't know about um, the entire, like, bottle of uh, liquor that I had, not the entire bottle, but like, you know, that much bottle of, uh, of hard liquor that I had also drank in addition to the beer, or an entire bottle of wine, you know, in addition to, to the beer so that I would hide and she never knew was even there. Um, that is Peter's Mountain. It's, uh, some, look it up. <laughs> some people, uh, think it's some sort of defense, uh, installation. Um, I think that's what that is. But those hay bales are really cool. Um, it's beautiful out here. Um, so, you know, my wife really, I had hidden my alcohol problem for years from everyone. And so, because I knew I was ashamed about it. Why do we hide things? We hide things because we are ashamed. And I was hiding my alcohol problem because I was ashamed of it. And so, you know, I told my wife uh, at the time we were in a really bad place, you know. Uh, and I tell all about that uh, in my uh, other video. Uh, which is uh, the video called uh, "Why, uh, How Motorcycles Stop Me From Killing Myself. I'll uh, throw a link to that in the description. And, um, but, you know, my wife was already really angry with me, you know, really not happy with me uh, at the time. And so I told her that I was going to be, that about my secret problem, you know, that I was addicted to alcohol and it had been a problem for years, like years and years, and that she just had no idea because I had been hiding it. So instead of like, I'm sure she was mad, but instead of saying, well, you know, you a-hole or whatever, she um, helped me in that moment. She helped me to get rid of any alcohol that was still in the house, any that I had hidden. She helped me by not bringing home bottles of wine or beer or anything like that. Uh, and she helped me, that's pretty, she helped me by, uh, she actually went behind the scenes, I didn't know this at the time, she actually told friends and family not to drink around me while I was still uh, new to giving up alcohol. And so, like, I had no idea, but she did so much for me to, to help me uh, when I was super weak. And, um, you know, it's the will, the craving, the, 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 the feeling that you need to, to have it is such a, a powerful thing and that's why people get you know go back to it especially when things get hard um, so that was number one number one was my accountability partner in, in the form of my wife uh, number two was uh, I actually joined a like a men's group uh, through my church and, and so what I mean is like group therapy like talk therapy uh, can be very helpful there's lots of um, alcohol specific group therapies out there like Alcoholics Anonymous or AA and also um, Celebrate Recovery that's another really good one Celebrate Recovery so you know if you don't have access to like a small group uh, that you can join some sort of therapeutic ju uh, therapeutic group that you can join um, then uh, you know look for your local chapters of Celebrate Recovery or AA Alcoholics Anonymous um, because those could be very helpful. And I'll tell you why they were so helpful to me. Um, I remember that uh, when I first got time going to this men's group, and it's like the, all these guys are like bro-hugging. Uh, they're hugging each other like, what's up, brother? You know, and I'm like, 
what's wrong with these guys? Like, why are they hugging each other? What kind of group is this? Like, I was in such a hardened place in my heart. Uh, all I could see and think was negative thoughts and cynical thoughts. And so I just remember that, like, um, I'm looking at these guys and they're they're close with each other, you know. Um, you know, they're brothers. They they do life together. That you know, and like there was a there was a part of me. I'm not gonna lie that kind of was jealous for that like like I don't have real, any relationships like that in my life I thought you know I, I want a bro hug like how come nobody cares about me like that how come I can't talk to my friends about stuff like these guys are talking about in this group and I couldn't believe it like they were talking about all this stuff in their lives and how broken their lives were and Wow, look at this. You never see this field all red like this. This is so cool. It looks like they just uh, plowed. Unbelievable. Um, but, you know, they were, these guys in this men's group, they're talking about their, their broken lives, and I'm over here like, oh, my gosh. Like, I, I'm not the only one that's screwed up. Like, it really helped me to feel better. Uh, you know, I think a lot of times we just want to know that we're not alone. And that's the truth. You're not always think that we are though we always think we're the only one going through whatever we're going through and uh, we're not you know you're not alone there's lots of other people that have gone through things similar to what you're um, that you've gone through or you're going through currently um, so don't be afraid to talk about it in the right places so group therapy you know that that really helped me accountability partner group therapy number three was uh, I saw two different counselors one was a police psychologist, kind of specific to the to the trade, right? Kind of understand what first responders see, uh, the, the the horrors that we see on a daily basis, you know, uh, the death of um, innocent people, the death of infants, you know, um, abuse of others, abuse of children, sexual abuse, physical abuse, uh, all sorts of horrors that we see every day, and um, and that's our job, you know, that's what we signed up for, but it's really hard to cope with that stuff, especially over a several um, year career, you know, I've been in it over 20 years. And so um, now I have healthy coping mechanisms and now I've resolved a lot of my trauma, so I am able to function in a healthy place, in a healthy space. And, and riding motorcycles is something that helps me to cope in healthy ways. Um, but seeing a police psychologist uh, really helped me to kind of talk me off the edge when I was actually suicidal um, and uh, and and kind of helped me validate my emotions and things like that um, you know a lot of men feel like they are not allowed to feel anything um, and uh, that's just BS like like you have to be able to express your emotions you have to be able to to sometimes even cry you know if it hurts that bad, um, if you keep stuffing it inside, um, then you're just gonna uh, blow up like uh, under the pressure. So, um, in addition to a police psychologist, just who I saw for um, about five or six months, and uh, he calls himself the cop doc. His name is Dr. Byron Greenberg. That's the the guy that I saw here in Virginia. He's based out of the the Richmond area. Uh, but in addition to his amazing uh, knowledge and services, I also uh, saw a, uh, a faith-based counselor, uh, but it doesn't have to be faith-based, like um, just, just any counselor who can deal with trauma, you know, if you've been through a lot of uh, traumatic things, um, can help. And, you know, the, the counselor that my wife and I, she saw the counselor with me, and I thought it was going to be like a marriage counselor type of thing, help us fix our marriage. But the counselor quickly realized when she started talking to me that um, I had a lot of brokenness, a lot of trauma that was unresolved. And so she knew that before we could even think about fixing uh, our marriage, that um, she had to work on me. Like, we had to fix me. Um, you can't take uh, a broken, uh, you know, a broken battered frame and restore an old classic car with it you know you have to do the work you have to restore it in the bones in the frame 
you know, in the engine, you know, in the heart, uh, before you can put it on the road and expect it to be a quality product. So that was really hard. Um, I, I can tell you, if you've ever seen a counselor, if, if it's hard to talk about the stuff you're talking about, that's how you know it's working. Like, it sucked. Um, but I had never uh, uh, never gone through anything like this before with a counselor, and so I just had to trust the system. I had to trust that this counselor was there uh, for me and was going to and was was doing these weird things, these weird exercises like the empty chair exercise. I'll tell you about that um, for some sort of reason, and I didn't understand it at the time. But, um, but it really worked. It really helped me. And, uh, you know, just one example of that, the empty chair, you know, was, uh, she said, she took a chair, the counselor, the, her name is um, Lynn Schwank. And Lynn uh, took an empty chair and she said, I want you to pretend that your father's sitting here. You're, you passed away when you were 12. Um, and I want you to tell him all the things that you never got to tell him. And I was like, what the heck? Like, that's stupid. I'm not gonna do that. Well, how is that gonna help me? And so she gave me a minute, you know, um, and uh, you know, basically, uh, my wife and, and the counselor said, "Look, like, you know, if you're not willing to try this stuff, you know, and do the work, then you're not gonna make any progress." And so I tried it, you know, reluctantly. I was like, "Okay, I'll pretend my dad's in the chair." who died when I was 12 and I will tell him all the things that I never got to tell him and uh, I'm not getting emotional just talking about it now like uh, all the things that I never got to tell him you know I never got to tell him uh, how much I loved him you know uh, at least I didn't feel like I got to tell him enough I was scared to death to talk to him when he was dying in that bed in our house I never got to uh, you know, he, he never saw me uh, graduate high school, you know, he never saw me go to the police academy, he never got to meet our daughter, um, you know, or my wife, um, so, you know, I felt like my whole life had been stolen from me with his, with his, the loss of my father, and um, to be able to feel like I was actually telling him that um, was pretty incredible. And uh, you can see, just by me getting emotional about it just right now, that it's still something that will always be something I carry with me. But I tell you, after I talked to this counselor, and you know, for, for like five, six months with my wife, you know, and we worked through this stuff, and not only that, with the, uh, the police drama too, this stuff no longer has control over me. This stuff no longer rules my life. Uh, I can now live free of it. Uh, you know, it's always there. It's always going to uh, define who I am. But it's not going to control who I am. And I can live my life. The life I've been given. So, talk to somebody. Because if you got stuff, and we all do, if you were abused, if you were... Um, your parents divorced... You know, if your one of your parents didn't treat you well, if you saw something traumatic when you were a child, like all this stuff, you oh, you got it. Sorry, roadkill. It looked like a dead cat. I love cats. Love dogs too, but hate seeing a dead cat. Um, unless it's on my camera mic. Uh, funny, but like talking to somebody for me, you know, whatever whatever you've been through, whatever was traumatic in your life, like if you if you never faced it, there it is controlling you, whether you know it or not. There it is controlling you. Holding you in chains. So, you know, accountability partner, group therapy, talk therapy, and then one other thing that I think is important to mention is like the physical part of it. So every night, you know, for years, my habit, you know,
know, it's like a vice, you know, our bodies learn things. And my body had learned that every night it was time to sit down and drink, watch TV and drink. And I would have, you know, that long neck bottle in my hand, a, a beer bottle. And a lot of times I'd pour my liquor in the, I'd drink half the beer and then fill it, fill it back up with liquor. I know it's gross, right? They call it a super beer. Um, I wouldn't call it a super beer to anybody else, just myself, because I was hiding it from everybody, but, um, but yeah, so I would also use tobacco, smokeless tobacco at the same time, it's disgusting, but here's a funny story, sometimes I would, I'm sure you can relate to this if you've ever used smokeless tobacco and been drinking, um, sometimes I would have two beer bottles, one for the beer, and my liquor I'd pour in the beer bottle, and, some, and one for them, to use as a spitter. Yes, you know, sometimes I grab the wrong bottle and I take a big old gulp, you know, in my inebriated state of uh, my own spit, tobacco spit, and <laughs> that was disgusting, but it happened a lot, so I kind of got used to it, um, but, uh, so what I would do instead, when I sat down at night, you know, because it's hard to just switch off a habit, you know, I think it's like 30 days to make a break a habit. What I did while I still needed that vice, that, that, you know, I'm doing something like that, is I actually got, would get Perrier, sparkling water, flavored water, like lime, lemon, whatever, and this other flavors too, or just plain, but I'd take the Perrier, and, uh, and I'd drink that, and I'd still use the smokeless tobacco too, like, because I, I don't want, you know, like, take it easy, you know, if you got a, several addictions, like, Maybe one at a time is enough to, to quit. So that was my first thing was to quit alcohol. That was the worst one. And so I would drink, the, you know, when I opened the Perrier, just like a beer, it would go like that sound, um, like that, you know, carbon release. And so, you know, I would uh, drink the Perrier, and it was like, I felt like, you know, it was like sitting there drinking my beer, but but I wasn't. I was drinking Perrier, and, you know, non-alcoholic and sparkling water. And so for a long time, I was on a sparkling water kick, and that helped me to get rid of that vice, that that routine of I have to have this, you know, drinking something. Um, and so you know, for at least 30 days, I I used that to kind of get me off of the of uh, drinking. Um, and then and I also had this inner commitment to myself, no matter what, it's going to get easier every day, no matter what, it's going to get easier every day, so stick to your commitment, and so I did, and after like a couple of months of Perrier, uh, I, uh, I started feeling like I didn't need alcohol, or uh, tobacco anymore, you know, so i had been alcohol free for a couple of months, and now it's like, this uh, tobacco, like, I've lost my taste for that, and it's like they complemented each other very well, and if you dip and if you've ever been drinking and, you know, you, you kind of feel like you need a dip, right, so, so I was able to give up smokeless tobacco, I'm like, I don't need this anymore, it's, and that's another cost, you know, that's, if you dip, you know, that's very expensive too, you use smokeless tobacco, and so uh, I would imagine it's probably similar with cigarettes, like, you know, I felt like I was able to give up two addictive things within six months. It was amazing. And so, you know, like, I'm telling you, oh, it's so true. Every day gets easier. Every day gets easier. And so you have to commit to it. You then do the right things. Don't just say, I'm going to quit drinking, and then that's it. You need support. You can't do it alone. Because if you could do it alone, you would have quit drinking a long time ago. Am I right? I know that I tried to quit several times on my own without telling anybody because they never knew I had a problem in the first place and there's nobody to hold me accountable so I would just go right back to it you know after a short hiatus um, what do they call it uh, falling off the wagon but now that I have had an accountability partner now I have a lifetime account accountability partner like you know, do I feel like I could go back and drink a beer every now and then? Maybe. Maybe. But I don't want to even mess with that. 
Why? Because alcohol controlled me, ruined and destroyed my life for so many years that I'm just done with it, bro. Like, I can't stand being having something to have control over me. You know, I got enough issues as it is that I don't need something having that kind of control over me. And so this is gonna hurt. Oh, that wasn't that bad. Big old drainage lid. So I just want to encourage you, like, you know, here I am. Look, it's a carnival. Not a carnival that I've stopped drinking. It is a carnival. It will be a celebration for you if you're able to stop drinking or stop using drugs. Because this applies to drink drugs as well. You know, using drugs and using drinking alcohol, it's still, it's an all an addiction. One may have more power than the other. I don't know. I've never had a drug addiction. But alcohol, I feel like, is a drug. And so... Um, I feel like um, that if you apply these same things to drug use, that um, it's going to help you big time to get to get off of drugs. So remember these, you know, these things. Get make the commitment. Number one. Number two. Get an accountability partner. Maybe two. Maybe three. You know, it doesn't have to be just one person. Have some people that will hold you accountable for your actions and um, go to therapy not only a therapist or a counselor by yourself or with your partner spouse but also some sort of group therapy because um, I guarantee that that is something that will be helpful to you um and then physically find something that will help you through your your routine to break that physical habit um because that's a, a big part of it as well got some bikes out today at stonewall harley davidson should stop by there in a moment and uh, see if they have any windshields. I was going to look at a wind splitter, 15 inch wind splitter, and see if they have any available for a test ride. It's before I drop $459 on one. Um, but yeah, so those things are all very important uh, because you can't just do it alone and you can't just stop drinking and expect that you'll never go back to it or stop using drugs and expect that you'll never go back to it until you resolve the reason that you started drinking or using drugs in the first place. You have to start at the root to kill the weed, if that makes sense. You have to kill whatever it is that started that. You have to address that trauma. And if you do, then it's going to help you to face it and in healthy ways, you know, and, and so that it doesn't have control over you anymore. And so that you're not trying to drown the pain that you're living with every day. So I just want to say thanks again for, um, for watching today. I hope that this helps someone out there. Um, if you've been struggling um, I want you to encourage you to reach out to me you can email me it's uh, revfreemoto at gmail.com or you can drop a comment if you're feeling courageous drop a comment and tell me how you defeated addiction because if you share your story, you're just going to empower somebody else or inspire them. So I'd encourage you to help, you know, help a brother, help a sister out who might be struggling today and, and comment. Um, if you haven't subscribed to 
Rev Free Moto. Appreciate your subscription and uh, liking the video is always a good thing too. So I'm gonna finish my motorcycle ride. Maybe stop by this Harley dealer. And I just want to say, uh, you know, God bless. Love you all. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Remember, it's not where you're going, but it's who you're becoming. It's not where you're going, but it's who you're becoming. All right. God bless. Take care.